Ladies and gentlemen, can I ask for your attention, please? If you want to take your seats, you're just about to start. Thank you.
Eh? Però aspetta, devo tenere il microfono, se no mi... Ah, ok, ok. Faccio un richiamo. Che ore sono? Preghiamo tutti gli ospiti di accomodarsi per piacere. Siamo un po' in ritardo, grazie. Anche i giornalisti per piacere, un po' di comprensione. Siamo stati comprensivi. If you would like all to take a seat, please, now we can start. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, signore e signori, good afternoon and welcome to the opening ceremony of Ease of 2020 Trieste. Before we get started, let me also welcome all people who are following the event from across the globe through the live streaming on our digital platform. Welcome all and thanks for joining us today. My name is Anna Lombardi. I am a data journalist at the Times of London, and it's a great honor and pleasure to be here for me today in this city that truly represents a lot to me. It has been a turning point in my own career. After a few years spent doing research uh, in experimental physics around Europe, I decided to change my career path, and I found my way right here in Trieste. Here, I've completed some studies in science communication at CISA, the International School for Advanced Studies, and I've worked for ICTP, the International Center of Theoretical Physics. And it's during this time in Trieste that I discovered my passion for data journalism, and I found that confidence to take the next step in my own career, moving from academic research to data journalism. So today, we are all here to celebrate such a unique city and its extraordinary ecosystem of research, education, and innovation. Just over two years ago, I was in Toulouse attending another ceremony, the closing ceremony of ESOF 2018, when Trieste received the legacy of Toulouse to organize ESOF Next Edition. Since then, the entire world has changed, quite dramatically, I would say. We are now facing unprecedented times, but despite the odds, we are here today to open the ninth edition of the Euroscience Open Forum, thanks to the incredible efforts this team has made to overcome all the challenges and make this happen. And I'm sure this edition won't be less than any of the previous ones. Of course, the current circumstances have imposed some changes. An hybrid format that has moved part of the events online has to be implemented, and the program is slightly tweaked, but the strong identity of ESOF has remained unchanged. Since its first edition, back in 2004 in Stockholm, ESOF has grown and it has traveled across Europe reaching a different European city every other year. But it has always had one key goal, to promote an open and honest debate 
around and about science and about its role in our society, a debate involving scientists, citizens, and all professionals working within the scientific realm. Now, Professor Stefano Fantoni, champion of ESOF 2020 Trieste, will tell us more about this ninth edition of ESOF in Trieste. If Professor Fantoni wants to join me on stage. And before... Sorry. Before his speech, a short video that will give you a taste of what ESOF 2020 Trieste will be all about. Trieste è una città di confine dove convivono in modo assolutamente unico lingue, etnie, addirittura geografie diverse come la montagna, il carso e il mare. La geografia, il paesaggio, la morfologia dell'area di Trieste sono quasi da considerare un miracolo è un miracolo anche la ricerca scientifica la tecnica la capacità di innovazione che questa città oggi rappresenta per l'europa il sistema triestino è al tempo stesso un'espressione dell'universalità degli ideali scientifici e un esempio specifico italiano ed europeo di come pensare, promuovere e organizzare la scienza a livello internazionale. Uno dei confini in realtà più severi che abbiamo oggi è quello tra la scienza e la comprensione umana di tutto ciò che la scienza sta trasformando. anche il luogo di convivenza di questi due modi di vedere la realtà. Your Eminence, Cardinal Piero Parolin, Gaetano Manfredi, Minister of the University and Research, Fabrizio Nicoletti, Director General for In of Innovation and Research, and at the Italian Ministry for Foreign Affairs, uh, Professor Michael Matlos, President of Euroscience, Roberto Di Piazza, Major of Trieste, Massimiliano Federica, President of Friuli Venezia Giulia, Professor Fabiola Gianotti, Director of CERN, Giulio Andoro from Post Italiana, and in remote, Ilaria Capua, the One Health Center of Excellence at the University of Florida, Sania Damianovic, Minister of Science from Montenegro, and Emanuel Nazimande, Minister of Science and Technology of South Africa. Colleagues, distinguished guests, friends, Good afternoon. I have the honor today to give to all of you my warmest welcome to the ninth edition of the Euroscience Open Forum 2020. Here, in this new and beautiful convention center. I am enormously pleased to see you here in this place to open an international event that will celebrate science, ideas, the dialogue between different knowledge and peoples, the role of Trieste and Friuli Venezia Giulia of Italy and Europe in the dissemination of knowledge. 
You have been waiting for more than two years to this moment, and here we are. First of all, let me spend some minutes on acknowledgements, and let me acknowledge uh, uh, to start with, uh, with the local and national scientific institutions. I start with research and science. It is thanks to them, to the high level of their research, and to their collaborative effort that we are here today. Together with them, I cannot forget that the rich and vibrant ecosystem of scientific knowledge and technological innovation that this territory has produced over the years. Let me thank the Director General of European Commission for Research, Science and Innovation that has been supporting uh, ESOF, that is the acronym of this event, since its beginning. Due to COVID, its presence is perhaps not as visible as we would have loved to see, but its help and attention have been crucial. The Italian government, and in particular the Ministry of University and Research, has immediately viewed in, as of uh, 2020 an important occasion for the promotion of the dialogue between science and the various components of the society, providing us an essential support. My sincere thanks go to them. I'm also particularly grateful to local and regional institutions to the Major of Trieste, Roberto Di Piazza, to the President of the Autonomous Region of Friuli, Venezia Giulia, Massimiliano Federica, for their fundamental role. Beyond the economic support, the municipality and the region have spent themselves with passion through an always constructive confrontation, even in difficult times, for a common goal, the, to enhance the excellence of the knowledge system of this territory and international level. I repeat, to enhance the excellence of the knowledge system of this territory to international level. I would like to acknowledge all the sponsors who contributed to the organization of this event, in particular our key and gold partners, Fincantieri, Ascegasi, Generali, Hilli, Trieste Trasporti, and I would like to give a, a warm and thankful to media partner, Rai Radio Television Italian, Italy. Italy. Finally, for this acknowledgement part, uh, sincere thanks go to all those who have understood the importance of organizing as of 2020, this year, despite the pandemic, despite uh, all the difficulties. A strong acknowledgement has to be reserved to all the members of the wonderful Trieste as of teams. They have been heroic in facing up with the many difficulties arisen, and more important, to solve them. Let me remember here one important member of this team, Pierpaolo Ferrante, who unfortunately is no longer with us, and we miss him very much. lives turned upside down. We find ourselves lost in our own home. And we now face a new planet. A world of contradictions. It happened before. We endured. And we strived. Within the dark, science is the light that leads the way out. Today, we must learn to reconnect. Harness technology for empathy. More than ever, it's time to start over. Against all odds, the debate must go on.
Ladies and gentlemen, I would like now to convey to all of you in this opening speech a couple of messages which I interpret, which interpret my personal view of Trieste, of, of this Trieste. The first one refers to the question, why as of 2020 Trieste in such a difficult time? Why to set up an international event while the warring winds of the global pandemic still range? While distressing words such as contagion, second wave, lockdown resound after months and who knows how long? While we are engaged in a very complicated decision for our future and for the future of the next generation on school, works, economy, health. The answer, in my view, is that precisely because in such difficult times the science cannot exempt itself from being a protagonist in everything is happening. Don't be afraid of knowledge. I repeat it, don't be afraid of knowledge. We must not be afraid of knowledge, especially in times of crisis, because it is precisely in these moments that we grasp the profound value constituted of modernity, of an approach to reality based on trust in the ability of human beings to investigate and to know the world. At the same time, we should be all aware of the fact that scientific research does not solve all the problems. It's not an handbook of certainties, but rather open up open us to doubt and complexity, to the uncertainty of the new, to the risk of the dream. Don't be afraid of the new. I repeat, don't be afraid of the new. Knowledge and not ignorance can lead to more freedom, more awareness, more democracy. It is no coincidence that the motto of this of 2020, Trieste, science for freedom and freedom for science, remind us of knowledge without barriers. It reminds us of the sailing ship of Instauratio Magna of Francis Bacon, the sailing ship of a new knowledge that exceeds the pillars of Hercules, beyond which there is an unknown territory, certainly risky, but opening to dream of finding better and richer lands. This is why we are here today, to testify that those who live on science, those who believe in science, live, an op live on optimism, trust in the human ability, not to succumb to the unknown, to difficulties. But let me now turn to my second message, which I want to address to my fellow scientists. After having spent my entire life uh, in, the, in the world of research with different roles and functions, uh, let me say that uh, even if it is uh, more reassuring to believe that our main power of the scientists, main duty, is to contribute to knowledge only in narrow fields of knowledge, to go deeper and deeper in the understanding, which uh, since today has led to fundamental discoveries, but for tomorrow, that is not enough. We have to go beyond. We scientists cannot believe that doing research means being in a comfort zone reserved for a few other people with whom we share elite interests. We must not forget that reality is unique. It, it knows no disciplinary sectors. The pandemic showed us even, there, even, even, there was, even if there was a need that the complexity of natural and social phenomena cannot be investigated from the perspective of a single discipline. We need to take this lesson back. Perhaps we can treasure in this, in this sense the terrible experience the world is going through if you are willing to a new way of doing research. Let me conclude in these regards with the words of the philosopher Karl Popper, who in one of his most significant works, All Life is Problem Solving, wrote about the future and change. 
The future is definitely open. It depends on us. From all of us, it depends on what we and many other people do and will do. Today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow. And what we do and what we'll do depends in turn on our desires, our hopes, our fears. It depends on how we see the world and how we evaluate the widely available possibilities of the future. We must become the creators of our destiny. Learn to do things in the best way possible and search for mistake. But this means that we have to change ourselves. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And I hope you will understand the effort we made to organize as of 2020 in this situation. I hope you will forgive us the inevitable imperfections, but that you will appreciate the sincerity of our motivation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fantoni, for your nice words. And <laughs> thank you again. And now let me introduce you Michael Matlots, president of Euroscience, the nonprofit association founded in 1997 and representing European scientists in all areas of knowledge, working in universities, research centers, public institutions, and business sectors. Please join me on stage. Uh, this side. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Buongiorno a tutti. Ladies and gentlemen, ease of participants both physically and remotely out there on the airwaves. Distinguished guests, partners, welcome to you all. It is my extreme pleasure to be here and to welcome you on behalf of Euroscience and all of its members here to ESOF 2020 in Trieste. Euroscience, the European Association for the Advancement of Science and Technology, is here to work with everyone both those within the scientific community and those within our society who do not necessarily work directly in the scientific community, but who wish to interact, dialogue, and discuss with scientists and what science is doing. We're in a very, very special time, and we might want to ask ourselves a question. Is it possible for a physical conference which was planned for several thousand participants to be held in July 2020 to be transformed in less than five months into a hybrid physical remote event held in September respecting scrupulously all of the indications of the health authorities regarding the restrictions resulting from a previously unknown viral disease that appeared only early this year. Is it possible to imagine that we could transform our event from a physical event for several thousand people in which the planning was already advanced almost to its final stages in January into the current event that we're having today. Is that possible? And the answer is yes, but it's only possible because it's ease off and because it's Trieste. 
I have often said, and I, I saw in, in Professor Fantoni's remarks something similar, that, you know, being optimistic is a choice. And it's the right choice. It's always the right choice. Because being optimistic allows you to go forward to take on challenges. And that is what we have done. Ease Off is the open forum. It's the open forum for exchange, discussion, and debate on science, science practice, and science's role in society. It was unthinkable for us, for Stefano, for me, that the opportunity for those exchanges, discussions, and debates precisely during this crucial period in our history when the interaction between science and society is so important should not take place. For us, that was unthinkable. It was never a question of canceling this event because it's too important. It's too important, particularly in the current context. Now, of course, you could ask, was it a challenge? And of course it was a challenge. And I think all of those who spent countless hours and days and weeks making it happen, the Trieste organizers, and particularly under the direction of Professor Fantoni, the Euroscience Office, the members of the Euroscience Governing Board, the, the members of Euroscience, the session organizers, all of the committee members and all of those who have worked behind the scenes to make this happen are heroes. They have done more than we could ever have expected them to do. A tremendous, enormous effort, and I would like to thank each and every one of them. Another question, after all of that effort, is it worth it? Absolutely, absolutely worth it. EZOF is more important than ever today, and the EZOF spirit, the EZOF spirit inclusive, based on dialogue, discussion, and debate, lives on through this event, both physically and virtually. We've reorganized these off 2020, and we've succeeded. We're proud of what we have accomplished, together with the Trieste organizers and all of the stakeholders, sponsors, con contributors, session organizers, and participants. We will take home all of the lessons learned from this experience on all levels for future innovation, for the future of EZOF and for the future of Euroscience and the future of science and society. I am extremely happy and extremely proud to participate in this opening of EZOF 2020. We always believed it would happen. We did, sincerely. Oh, maybe we had a couple of minutes of doubt, but really we always believed in it. I would like to express again my immense gratitude to all of those working behind the scenes and who have made this possible, and all of you who have decided, either physically or virtually, to attend our Ease of 2020 event. Thank you very much to you all. Grazie mille. Welcoming Roberto Di Piazza, Mayor of Trieste. The municipality has strongly supported the event since the very beginning, since its application to become City of Science 2020. And the video that will be shown during the speech, it has been realized and provided by Promo Turismo that we would like here to thank. Un saluto e ringrazio di essere qui il Cardinale Piero Parolin, il Ministro Gaetano Manfredi, 
il governatore del Friuli Venezia Giulia Massimiliano Fedriga. Fedriga. The Prefect Valerio Valenti. All authorities and all our guests. I'm, it's really with strong emotions that I uh, take this podium. Uh, a year ago, there was nothing here. Stefano, I wish to thank you. It has been a wonderful adventure. I thank you and your collaborator. But since Toulouse, really, we've been going through an extraordinary period of time. And this is the greatest achievement that we could have. The nicest compliment was paid to me by President uh, Galaterio of Generali. He told me, now we know where the next meeting is going to take place. We will have it here in Trieste. And I thank President Galateri for his words. Trieste is a multi-ethnic city, uh, many different faiths, many believers of different faiths live in Trieste. We have the Greek community, the Orthodox Serbian community. We have the largest a synagogue in Europe, we have a Serbian Orthodox Church, the Greek temple. We have important companies, a general insurance company, general insurance company. We have the headquarters of Fincantieri here in Trieste with orders for 35 billion euros. We have Ili Cafe, we have many other highly technological uh, companies. It's a city that has lived on the sea. Now we are the first port in Italy. And five years ago, the old port was, uh, um, a concession was signed for the old port. And this is just a part of those 65 hectares that have been given away as a concession. There are major investors wanted to invest in the old port. Within a few days, uh, uh, changes will be adopted to uh, the urban planning that will allow us to start a completely new uh, process and development for our city. I'm very satisfied. I'm very proud to be a mayor of this city, a multi-ethnic city with many different faiths and confessions, but especially a city that belongs to Middle Europe. Um, we were talking about United Europe even before European Union came about. Uh, we are um, ranking uh, among the first cities in Italy for the quality of life. With ease of, we've seen so many foreign guests walking here, and it's a safe city as well. I thank you for being here. I wish to thank Stefano once again, because we have been going through a wonderful adventure that started two years ago in Toulouse. Um, not many believed in this achievement, but we made it. We made it. Now we have a, a nice uh, convention center, one of the largest in this part of Italy, and that will bring about further growth and development for our city. Thank you. Now I invite the president of Friuli Venezia Giulia region, Mr. Massimiliano Fedriga. Please join me on stage. In this case, um, a video realized by the scientific and innovation system of Friuli Venezia Giulia will be shown. And it will show you how rich and dynamic the research system of this region is. I get rid of my face mask. I know we are being very careful with all restrictions. But first of all, I wish First of all, I wish to thank Professor Fantoni, who really believed in this enterprise right from the beginning. He believed in this international event in a region, a region which is the only Italian region, according to the European Commission, that is strongly innovative within our country. I wish to thank uh, the minister, who is here with us today, and the secretary of uh, the Vatican, also attending this event. And I think that his attendance is of great relevance for us all for the message, for the message that ESOF and this edition of ESOF wants to launch in particular. In other words, freedom related to science. 
I was taught, and I apologize, uh, Your Eminence, but I was taught that there's no freedom without knowledge and truth. Otherwise, it is just a, a free abidium. If I'm not uh, free to choose uh, and to make a choice, uh, then my choice is going to be meaningless. But I have to say that the process of knowledge cannot do without ethics. Freedom doesn't mean anarchy. Freedom is, first of all, responsibility. And as a politician, with all the limitation that it entails, I believe that this is one of the principles that we have to have very dear, also when we are having a scientific uh, debate. We have trusted in science, even during the pandemic, the pandemic that has unfortunately afflicted, affected our populations and our uh, territory. ESAF, I think, can be a major opportunity, the opportunity to question ourselves, to question our own limitations, to know uh, what, what, what went wrong, because I believe that in that principle of truth, which I uh, highlighted right at the beginning, lies the clarity of our positions. We have to be clear, the major scientific institutions in the world have been missing uh, quite often during the pandemic. Our Vice President of the region, Riccardi, is here with me together with other regional ministers, Rosalind and Roberti. Mr. Riccardi is in, in charge of health. We trusted our uh, health organizations because the major international organizations after uh, the pandemic became known, did not warn us to buy ventilators, to buy personal protective devices, or to increase the capacity of our intensive care units. I'm not blaming anyone. I'm just saying that we have to be aware of our limitations. We have to be more humble. And I have seen that sometimes working in the hospital, sometimes it's much better than many publications, many scientific publications. Nevertheless, I believe that the contribution by, the science, by science is, is crucial. And it is crucial because, and I'm very worried as, as a politician, uh, because I hear that there are many uh, saying things that have nothing to do with science or, or safety. And this is why I believe that we have to believe in science. As a governor, I believe that it is unacceptable uh, to have demonstrations saying that face masks are useless, the pandemic is a fake. As politicians, we have to be responsible, and I think that as a region, we really made uh, difficult choices right at the beginning of the pandemic. And on the other hand, we have to rely on experts, because personally, I wouldn't be able to make any assessment going over and above my responsibility. I have to leave experts do uh, what they are good at. And I, I'm saying that, being the governor of a region where we have many scientific organizations, uh, and I believe that the development of our region is in their hands. A few days ago, when the uh, convention center was officially open, I had the opportunity to say that Trieste and Friuli Venezia Giulia have are very rich in terms of research and scientific development, in, especially in terms of uh, basic research. Basic research has to be enhanced, but we have also to further promote applied research. Basic research has been abandoned and relinquished by some countries, and I think this is a mistake. Still, I believe that we have to bank on applied research, which can be an engine for employment and growth and development. And this is why today, as a, a governor of this region. Today, we're not just simply officially opening an event, a debate that's going to last for a few days. I hope that here together, 
Today, we are opening a completely new path where fuel in Venezia, Giulia, and Trieste can be the main actor at international level, able to attract people and researchers from abroad. And the region will take up this role. The training capabilities of this territory are enormous, and I think that they can be a point of reference for the whole of Europe and the whole world. I wish you all fruitful result. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to all the authorities for their contributions. Now I have the honor to introduce Your Eminence, Cardinal Piero Parolin, Secretary of State of the Holy See. Thanks for joining us today and be with us today. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I cordially greet the organizers and participants in the Euroscience Open Forum and wish to thank you for the kind invitation to take part in this opening ceremony. I am honored to be able to speak at this most prestigious international event and within the, the reflection on the relationship between science and faith, to try to echo the thinking of the Church on issues that are particularly dear to Pope Francis, whose greetings and best wishes I happily extend to you all. In dialogue with the sciences, we are very attentive to scientists and researchers especially when they speak in defense of the dignity of uh, human, the human person, of global justice, and of care for our common home. These three things are essential for envisioning and achieving a future of peaceful coexistence among people. The dialogue is uh, fundamental because, uh, in the first place, uh, if we take a stock at the overall global situation at present, it appears that humanity is going through a period that uh, in the course of the next few years will require it to address a number of challenges that may well affect the very identity and the future of life. There is a second element that makes the dialogue between science and faith an important issue, namely our duty and desire to pass on to future generations all that is precious in what we have either to come to understand and experience. Finally, there is a third element that makes the dialogue between science and faith a critical matter, namely being aware of living in what in many ways is a period of crisis in the understanding of the human person and in the dignity associated with it. Let us try to take a deeper look at these three themes in order to see the shape that such a dialogue may take. First, first of all, humanity's relationship to the environment. If uh, we look uh, at the 2019 report of the United Nations Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, compiled over three years by 145 experts from 50 countries, with a contribution from another 3,010 authors, we find certain incontrovertible data. 
Since 1900, the average number of autochthonous species in the majority of the world's habitats has diminished by at least 20%. More than 40% of the amphibian species, almost 33% of the coral that forms the coral reef, and more than a third of all marine mammals are threatened with destruction. Although the picture is less clear, 10% of insect species seem to be at risk of extinction. At last, 680 species of vertebrates became extinct between the 16th century. In 2016, as well as more than 9% of all domestic species of mammals used for food and agriculture. It is not worthy that, based on the systematic review of approximately 15,000 scientific and governmental sources, the report draws for the very first time on this scale from local and indigenous knowledge and deals in particular with issues concerning the indigenous population and local communities. The study reminds of us of an evident truth. Today's generations are responsible for bequeathing to future generations a planet that is not irreversibly damaged by human activity. Sadly, one sees an ever-growing number of voices from politicians, scientists, and men and women of different religious confessions stressing that humanity has produced a global impact that can no longer be undone. Well-being, longer life expectancy, and higher quality of life that we have achieved for some, still relatively few inhabitants of our world, are indeed impressive. These benefits, however, are still not available for everyone. Today, we are more and more aware, too, of the cost being paid by our plan planet, a cost unequally divided between the different countries of the world. This profound global impact should challenge us all. If we want to survive, and if we want life on this planet to survive, then we still have to learn to assume responsibility for our common home on the global level. At the same time, science by itself is not enough to resolve this problem. The study of bio biological system and ecosystem has enabled us to understand life and the world as a complex system. Concepts borrowed from biology have also raised new questions for philosophy. Complexity and emergence have left the technical scientific sphere, sphere to become influential categories in philosophical and theological reflection, to say nothing of other disciplines. In considering the so-called ecological problem, two possible approaches are opposed. One approach that wants to take account of that complexity to offer a holistic vision of the ecological problem, and a reductionist approach that concentrates mostly on the individual problems in an attempt to find practical solutions to individual questions. In using the word reductionist, I should clearly clarify that this does not imply a value judgment, but simply describes an analytic procedure that dissects the problem into its individual parts, thus reducing a macroscopic phenomenon to its eventual microscopic components. These uh, two approaches, holistic and reductionist, need to be integrated and complement one another. Only through a holistic view can we understand the context of the phenomenon studied, and through a reductionist view to know the details and components of the phenomenon in question. In Laudato Si, 
The Church acknowledges these two approaches and surpasses them, integrating them into their overarching vision of an integral ecology. What we mean by the expression integral ecology becomes clear from a phrase that in various ways recurs throughout Laudato Si. Everything is related. Everything is linked. Everything is connected. An integral ecology must first recognize the need to find integral solutions that take into consideration the interaction of natural systems among themselves and with social systems. We are not facing two separate crises, environmental and social, but we are facing one only single and complex social environmental crisis. Strategies for a solution demand an integrated approach, not least for combating the different forms of poverty. Secondly, you must pay attention to the bonds and relationships that exist between human beings, other living creatures, and their natural habitat. If everything is related, then the health of a society institutions has consequences for the environment and the quality of human life. In this sense, social ecology is necessarily institutional and gradually extends to the whole of society, from the primary social group, the family, to the wider local, national, and international communities. One particular interesting and significant process for our dialogue is the acknowledgement that the interdisciplinary approach proposed by Laudato Si should not limit it to the exact sciences. It should also include, for example, religion, which cannot be relegated to the sphere of the irrational, and all those forms of wisdom that humanity has, has developed over the course of history. It seems commendable that, at least in part, this uh, sapiential dimension has already been acknowledged by the involvement of indigenous culture in the UN report uh, cited above. Finally, an integral ecology demands that our research take into account not only the rational understanding of reality, characteristics in particular of Western thoughts, but that it should also embrace the desires and longings of the human heart. It needs to, it needs to have an authentically spiritual dimension. The challenge of humanity's relationship to the environment, therefore, offers a privileged forum in which science and faith can find themselves allies, working together for the good of the human person. It demands an integrated body of knowledge that can move the mind and heart of human beings and concretely change their lifestyles. The second point I would like to speak of is humanity relationship with technology, with the environment, the first part, the second, with the technology. If we look at technological innovation, we are struck by the fact that some technologies are advancing not in a linear fashion, but on an exponential curve. According to some social scientists, this means that the next 20 years may present technological changes so profound as to make almost irrelevant everything that has come before. Evaluating these kinds of changes is notoriously difficult. Science and technology in developing new and unprecedented abilities has left to the wider community decisions about the right thing to do and how to do it. Yet, many of our contemporaries do not seem able to adapt to their rapidity and scope of change. In these advances, science and technology are providing us with immense know-how. The question that we must face together is this. Given everything that we are technically able to do, 
what is it ethically right to do? All this merits consideration as we are building an unprecedented global community digitally interconnected. The scientific and technology, technological revolution that brought us the computer and information technology was indeed impressive. Not even science is immune from the transformation that the digital world is bringing to our lives and our social relationship. More generally, however, we can speak of one unprecedented and global challenge. The use of computers and information technology and artificial intelligence in particular has made us aware of a linguistic challenge arising on the borderline between persons and machines. In the interplay between persons and machines, projections and exchanges, hitherto unforeseen, are emerging and in perception of many, machines are becoming more human even as human beings are becoming more like machines. The church is deeply concerned about the effect of this exponential digitalization of communication and of society of young people. According to some authors, this effect could even bring about a genuine anthropological transformation the advent of digital natives. The effects of the media diet to which all of us are exposed also change the trust that our contemporaries place in the news they receive. Traditional sources of authority appear no longer to be considered automatically valid. We are also witnessing the spread of new beliefs and opinions unsupported by objective scientific data. It strikes me that this was particularly apparent during the COVID-19 pandemic. Much harm was caused by incorrect scientific information. The pandemic seems to have created what may be the most difficult period in decades for scientific communication. Any professional who speaks about this pandemic should spend a lot of time thinking about how word and data matter and then act accordingly. Again, the issue is no longer just scientific facts and objectivity, but uh, to use a biblical expression, the heart of man. The church, uh, as an ex expert in humanity, wants to accompany, together with sound science, the men and women of this generation in every authentic effort to seek truth. And finally, humanity relationship with itself. In conclusion, I would like to share with you a question that I believe to be crucial. How can the human family acquire the collective and individual wisdom to accept this responsibility and exercise the technological and scientific power presently at, your, at their disposal. There is no doubt that we are living uh, at a time of great anxiety. The objective data of science alone are not sufficient. First, this sense of anxiety must be removed from the collective subconscious well, where it dwells. That is to say, we must ident identify the causes that entrap us in this contradicted and anxious view. The loss of hope and of interest in the immediate and more distant future stems from a loss of our sense of what it is to be human. Only if we become aware that we have lost this perspective, we will be able to come up with an answer. And second, we need to return to being a community. When man is reduced to a mere individual and all his relationships are replaced by technologies, this atomized existence becomes, becomes is isolated and lonely. But the meaning of man, his ability to go beyond the merely material level, becomes evident and takes shape only in interpersonal relationship. Only by returning to a world of real and non-virtual relationship, 
will, be, will we be able to recover those horizons of meaning that can give rise to a shared desire to build for the future? The ultimate uh, and fundamental question then is that, what might make us say that te technological progress is something good? What might allow us to look to the future we hope, that is, with a desire for life and time that can accompany us toward the future? To answer uh, this essential question, we must make a fundamental distinction between progress and development. In the case of te technology, progress indicates a gradual advance or change resulting in greater growth in capacity and potential. It is a, a simply a technical increase in capacity. Can all progress be called good? In response, we can say, it depends. For not all forms of progress are good, directed to the good or entail only what is good. To speak of good progress, we need a category capable of describing those characteristics of progress that contribute to the good of individuals and society, and how they do so. Here, we can use the category of integral human development, an essential concept for the dialogue between faith and science, where as Pope Benedict XVI recalls in the encyclical letter Caritas in Veritate, charity in truth is the principal driving force behind the authentic development of every person and of all humanity. Love, Caritas, is an extraordinary force which leads people to opt for courageous and generous engagement in the field of justice and peace. It is a force that has its origins in God, eternal love, and absolute truth. Each person fights his good by adherence to God's plan for him in order to realize it fully. In this plan, he finds his truth, and through adherence to his truth, he becomes free. To defend the truth, to articulate it with humility and conviction, and to bear witness to it in life, are therefore exacting and indis indispensable forms of charity. To make uh, truly human choices uh, today does not mean uncritically accepting the position of others, even when based in clear scientific studies. Rather, it means trying to turn progress into development by trying to direct science and technology towards the fulfillment of the whole man and of every man, as Pope Paul VI was saying in Populorium Progressio, moving from less than human conditions to truly human ones, overcoming the difficulties that are inevitably encountered along the way, the challenges posed by the current COVID-19 pandemic are clearly indicative of the importance of making progress towards real development. As Pope Paul VI recalls, genuine development is the new name for peace. The quest for integral human development extends beyond the limited scope of economic, social, technological, and scientific progress, important as these are. It requires an authentic and untiring search for, the, for that which is truly constructive of the common good of humanity, which is the indispensable source and a continued companion of a real, lasting, and sustainable peace among peoples and for future generations. I hope that this forum as well might make a real contribution in this sense. And I thank you very much for your attention. now the great privilege to introduce our next three keynote speakers. 
Together with them, we'll discuss the extraordinary times we are living in, and in particular, they will tell us more about how this global pandemic that has put the entire world on hold, affecting our lives, economies, and societies, has also affected scientific research. And what can we all learn from this? Please join me in welcoming Gaetano Manfredi, Italian Minister of University and Research. Thank you. Fabiola Gianotti, Director General at CERN. Thank you. And Ilaria Capua, a professor at the University of Florida, who is connected with us remotely today and will give a speech shortly. Good afternoon and welcome. <laughs> so first I give the floor to Gaetano Manfredi. Okay, thank you very much. I speak in Italian in this, in this uh, my speech. But uh, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the organizers in Trieste. It is, uh, uh, I'm ex particularly glad and happy to be here in Trieste on such an important occasion. I would like to thank uh, the local uh, institutions, uh, the president of the region, the mayor of Trieste who supported this initiative. I would like to thank the uh, organization as a whole, Stefano Fantoni, with whom we shared this uh, journey for a long time, even before I was appointed as minister of the Italian Republic, because Stefano wanted this initiative strongly. He wanted Trieste and Italy to be at the center of European science this year. And this choice was a, a prophetical choice. I think that no one of us would expect such a pandemic to come about. Uh, this pandemic uh, is certainly a time of great effort, great suffering. However, speaking about science, at this time is a way to, to think about a future that in this time of transformation of the whole world. It is a time for us to reflect and also of self-criticism, but also of hope. We cannot look at the future with optimism, with the awareness that humanity has been facing a number of such difficult times, many pandemics, many wars, many times of crisis. However, uh, it has always find, found in these dark times a uh, reason to hope, a reason for a new reason, a reason for a further progress in social coexistence and in knowledge. The the topic of this meeting and the place of this meeting uh, let us uh, reflect upon uh, two things, I believe, fundamentals. The idea of science as a, um, as a driver for a common growth. I think this is a time when we need to ponder that from the point of view of citizens, science is, uh, has always, has often been looked at as something uh, stranger, something far away, something that belonged to an elite, an elite of researchers, of scientists that brought about, that made progresses in knowledge, but who could actually uh, not perceive the uh, positive outcomes for the uh, everyday life and for the for the common good. 
Uh, this emergency will be overcome sooner or later. We are still in a very difficult time today, but this pandemic will be tackled with the, in the instruments of knowledge of medicine. We are getting closer to the uh, possibility of uh, vaccination and better treatments, and this will uh, slowly bring us back to our normal life. However, the world uh, the, of the future will be different. It will be a world where we'll need to reaffirm strongly the role of uh, scientific research as a central uh, driver for the growth of our community. A large part of our population realized that the building of knowledge is essential in social growth. Today, we need a free and open research a research that has a strong impact on the common good, on the common well-being. And this process uh, gives researchers new responsibilities. Today, we shall uh, review the target, uh, and I'm speaking as a minister, but also as a researcher, because we shall uh, uh, enlarge the impact of our research activity, both towards society and the community, but also towards the economy, which is uh, certainly a, a driver for growth and well-being. I believe that scientific research needs to be looked at more and more as a common good, a common good that is shared by everyone, a common good in which everyone believes for the development of the society. This crisis is actually uh, actually accelerated a number of processes that were already taking place uh, in a slower manner, certainly, but uh, were already present in our society. And I would like to underline uh, three of these kind of processes. Uh, the deep impact of technological innovation, especially di uh, digital innovation on the organization of uh, our society, on our lifestyles, this transformation affects our, the organization of our everyday life, our everyday habits. This changes also the uh, model of value production, of industrial production, of service production. Uh, the uh, transformation has come about that sees a change in the global stakeholders um, that are becoming stronger um, players uh, as regards certain choices. And then uh, radical transformation affected also the, um, the, the labor world. And work is, is certainly uh, more and more fundamental for the well-being of people and uh, 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 jobs that have a low salary uh, do not have uh, do not affect positively our well-being. So having a more stable job, having a higher salary, actually affects positively positively the well-being. So the importance of uh, work and employment in everyday life. In this post-COVID time, uh, we should also take into consideration the international value of research. Research has always been in the history of man uh, a, 
an instrument for internationalization, uh, an instrument that goes beyond the geographical barriers. Uh, researchers uh, are citizens of the world. They are men and women that so in exchange and in relations they vary uh, value. As we speak about globalization and nationalism, so the role of research as a driver for an international vision of our growth is uh, strategic more uh, today more than ever. Often, the soft power of international relations is connected to the relation between researchers, the ability of research to be open and free and go beyond geographical barriers and political stances. This new uh, central um, importance of research is uh, underlined by this uh, event as well. Uh, the op Open Science Forum is an important opportunity to uh, to dis to give uh, to announce the significance of research in our lives. So the need to transform our vision of research involves also the need. To, in, to uh, involve citizenship in uh, our work. We need to make citizens understand how much the social well-being, the economical well-being is connected to a progress in knowledge. The prog a progress in knowledge enables growth, well-being, democracy, relations. This vision that was also enhanced by the uh, opening uh, um, speech of uh, uh, Professor Fantoni, research as a common good, as a common heritage, as a common growth uh, is an important uh, driver for the growth of research after this COVID pandemic. And it, we need to be prepared as scientific institutions, as individual scientists, uh, as institutions uh, to this uh, mission. We need to put the citizen, the individu individual at the center of our work without losing sight of the founding value of uh, scientific research according to Galileo's principle. some targets I believe uh, we should uh, uh, work on are the followings. First, complexity. In the pandemic, we uh, realized how much the uh, issues, the problems of a society which is more, more and more interconnected, the problems are getting more complex and complexity cannot be solved through simplification. Complexity can be addressed by a multidisciplinary response. The ability of research that goes beyond the limits of the different disciplines is our main challenge today. We have have uh, the need to overcome the barriers uh, uh, that are inside the scientific world, but also the barriers between scientific knowledge and uh, social and human knowledge, because the complexity of the problems uh, we are facing requires a higher multidisciplinary approach that goes beyond the barriers and that requires a common language among researchers. Another important issue is a strengthening uh, base research. We often, sometimes, we believe the basic research is not much useful, but uh, 
I often make the following example. If we want in a field to be grown beautiful flowers, beautiful plants, the, that field need, requires work, requires water. The desert does not give life to plants and flowers. So what we, what we mean by basic research, basic research, uh, uh, the sea is uh, the seeds are uh, the water that enable research to grow. If we do not understand this, then we cannot understand the future. Therefore, we need to uh, fuel basic research. This also belongs to our national plan for the future months. It is decisive for a strategic vision. But at the same time, if on one hand we need to enhance basic research, we shall also promote a mission-oriented research, a research oriented to the great challenges for the present and the future. I'm thinking about artificial intelligence, new materials, robotics, and a long list uh, as possible, precision agriculture, many issues that uh, uh, are synonyms for future, for well-being, for growth. In order to do that, uh, public and private research needs to be more and more connected, uh, as well as a, a greater connection is necessary between research and economy, research and finance. In this in these uh, important fields, so we need to think about new, n new ways of relations between the public and the private sector uh, in sight of a common goal of a, of a, a shared and sustainable growth for our planet. And that, and finally, there are uh, another two aspects I would like to mention. Training, education. Today, the passage from research to teaching is, uh, is almost automatic. When we teach in our university. We shall not uh, explain simply what was done in the past. We shall explain and teach what is being made today. Otherwise, there's a gap between learning and advance, advance in science. So we need educational programs that are being updated by keeping the fundamental skills and competencies, but are actually updated with the new achievements in science. I would like to conclude with a topic I introduced at the beginning, which is the relation between research and society. I believe that today's responsibility for researchers is not only to abide to the scientific method and to work among peers. He also needs to uh, enter into communication with a society, with a larger society, to, to transfer his knowledge to the society. This is a way to fight one of the main problems we face today, that is uh, the spreading, the dissemination of an anti-scientific culture in society. And this is a responsibility that belongs not only to the politic field or to the media, but also to the researchers. Today, the application, implementation of many discoveries is being slowed down by uh, the reaction of society. I'm thinking about vaccines, for example, or renewable energies, or many other uh, technologies that are clearly positive and for uh, for uh, the people, but are being um, 
actually criticized by the people, that are being fired by the people. So scientists, researchers need to explain that what they do, that their work is useful for the society. So the scientists need to convey that his work inside his lab is for the for a common good and for the good of society. So a widespread knowledge and the advancement of technology is a strategical mission in order for us to be able to 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 transform us, our society into a society that um, grasp the uh, best uh, the, the the at best the outcomes of scientific. This is one of the teachings we can take from the time of the pandemics and this debate here in Italy in Trieste, which is a crossroads of culture of meeting of debates, which has always been going as always gone behind uh, national and geographical frontiers as a deep symbolical significance. Therefore, I would like to thank again all those who contributed to this important event. And I would like to um, underline once again the commitment of our government that will be also announced by the uh, prime minister that you will be hearing at uh, the closing ceremony of the government. The maximum support of our government to the central uh, role of science as a, fa as a driver for uh, development for our country and for the whole of Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much for the contribution. And now I leave the floor to Professor Fabiola Gianotti, the Director General at CERN. As the Director General of such a big and complex scientific infrastructure as CERN is. What has changed with this recent pandemic? What, what's your view on that? Thank you very much for the uh, invitation to take part in this very interesting panel. I'm waiting for the slides to be uploaded. It should come on soon. In particular, I would like to thank uh, Professor Fantoni for, uh, for, for the invitation. So, um, looking for the... Uh, the, uh, the theme of this uh, panel is uh, a new culture of research and, and science within society. And, um, and I thought that I would like to, um, to share with you some, some thoughts about scientific research, and in particular fundamental research, uh, not just as a source of knowledge, but as a system of values. And the importance of these values for today's society uh, in dealing with the current pandemic, uh, but also for our future recovery and to address any other global challenge that humanity will have to face. And, uh, and in order to introduce um, the concept that I would like to share, to share with you, let me take uh, a concrete example as an illustration. Of course, the example that I'm going to take for a few minutes is, is the place where I work. So uh, CERN, the, uh, the largest laboratory for particle physics in, in, in the world. Um, it's an intergovernmental organization based in Geneva, which has a, has a primary mission uh, fundamental research in particle physics. And particle physics is the most fundamental of all sciences because it studies uh, the smallest con uh, constituents of matters. And these studies also allow us to understand the, the structure and evolution of the universe. Uh, at the same time, our scientific goals are so ambitious uh, that they require very complex uh, and uh, state-of-the-art instruments to be tackled, to be addressed. And therefore, the development of uh, advanced technologies in, um, in many fields, from uh, superconducting magnets to big data, from uh, uh, electronics to uh, cryogenics uh, and vacuum, etc. Another important pillar of our mission is training, training of tomorrow scientists and also education of the general public and uh, high school students or uh, uh, kids. Um, and last but not least, um, CERN is a concrete example of 
collaboration across borders because it brings together some 18,000 scientists. More than 110 nationalities are uh, represented. So I would like to remind you that CERN was founded in 1954. This was in the aftermath of World War II. So it was after a crisis, showing that crisis is a big opportunity to start with something new. And it was founded with uh, two goals by visionary scientists and politicians, and a member for Italy, Edoardo Maldi. Uh, first of all, to rebuild uh, scientific research and scientific excellence in, in Europe after the war where many scientists have left the, the continent. And so this reflects the awareness that also the uh, economic growth um, is also based on uh, excellent scientific research. And second, foster peaceful collaboration after disaster of the world, which again reflects the awareness that science is a powerful tool to break walls. And if you look at the, at the CERN convention, which is a very short but visionary document, you will find the following ingredients. CERN should pursue scientific research of fundamental uh, character with no military purpose. All the results and any information should be available to everybody and disseminated. This is what we call today open science. At that time, it was not called open science, but it was open science anti-literum. Anti Training and, uh, and education are also very important, and prom promoting peaceful collaboration, what today we call science for peace. So today CERN has 23 member states, but we also have some 50 international cooperation agreements, uh, most of them with developing countries. And so for those countries actually, engaging with fundamental research with an organization like CERN is part of their efforts toward developing development, towards building capacity, and towards having a, a knowledge-based um, economical system. Our budget is around 1.2 billion Swiss francs and is shared by the member states. And I would like to emphasize that the, the budget's stability over decades is a crucial tool that has allowed us to accomplish uh, extremely um, challenging project that no single countries could uh, carry out alone. And actually, thanks to CERN, we have been able to bring back leadership in fundamental physics to, back to Europe. So thanks to CERN and the European institutes uh, working at CERN. We run today the Large Hadron Collider, which, I, uh, as you know, is the most powerful accelerator. It's a 27-kilometer ring filled with the technology where we circulate two beams of protons and we collide them uh, in four big experiments. Operation started in 2010, and then uh, just two years later, we uh, reported the discovery of a new and very special particle, the, um, the Higgs boson. Since we are hosted by uh, Italy, let me stress that uh, Italy, through INFN, the Istituto Nazionale di Fisica Nucleare, the university and industry have contributed in, uh, in a very important way to the accelerator, the experiments, and the computing infrastructure, and also there are groups from, uh, from the University of Trieste involved in, um, in uh, at CERN, work at CERN. Now, this unprecedented project w could not and would not have been possible without the collaboration of brains coming from uh, uh, across the planet. So here you can see uh, the map of the physicists involved in certain activities. You can see that most of them come from uh, member state countries in, in dark blue, but also many of them from uh, uh, countries that are on the, on the front line of technology and are not member states, like uh, the US, like uh, Japan, China, and Russia. But also, many of them come from countries, you can see Madagascar, Oman, Bangladesh, which are not really on the front line of technologies. These are developing countries. And for these countries working at CERN, and for us, our mission with them is to build capacity and help uh, reduce the gap with the uh, developing, uh, developed uh, states and nations. And you can also see that there are countries that are not the best friends of each other, and they are scientists, yet they work together at CERN animated by the same, same goals. If you look at the age distribution of those scientists, you see that the peak is at 27 years, and more than 50% of them are below 40, so the population is mainly young. But only 10% of them 
uh, remain in research in particle physics. Most of them go somewhere else. Uh, those who leave go, half of them to other public organizations and half of them to industry, the private sector, so finance, computing, engineering, etc. So our goal and the goal of fundamental research is also to prepare them for any uh, walks of life and for many different professional um, activities. And last but not least, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, our ambitious uh, goals require the development of high-tech in, uh, instruments and so cutting-edge technologies that find application um, uh, in many um, domains of society. And of course, these um, technologies are transferred for free to everyone according to, uh, based on, on the, on, on the um, prescription of our uh, convention. So the most uh, famous example is the World Wide Web, which has been developed at CERN in the uh, late um, 80s. But there are many others, from solar panels to uh, uh, the techniques to analyze historical relics, and to the use of protons and uh, light carbon ions to treat uh, cancer to the so-called hydrotherapy. Now, CERN is not alone in these uh, missions, but we share our values and, and goals with seven other large European uh, research uh, infrastructure, and together we, um, we are part of uh, the Aeroforum Consortium. You can see here the list of the eight partners, and they range from particle physics with CERN to ESA, European Space Agency, to uh, EMBL, the European European Molecular Biology Laboratory to synchrotron light uh, sources like SRF in uh, Grenoble or a neutron facility like ILL. So very, very different scientific, um, scientific domains, but the same goals and the same values, which I've summarized in, in these slides uh, just to, to, uh, to conclude this part of my presentation on this, uh, on this value. So we all provide world-leading research facilities and so excellent science, attracting a large number of scientists from all over the world, in total 100,000 uh, people. All these organizations are based on intergovernmental treaties or other conventions among member states. And these treaties gives us the budget con uh, stability that has allowed us to uh, accomplish project that would have been impossible with just not even a, a single, um, a single uh, uh, institution, but even a single country. They are governed, we are governed by council, and our projects are peer-reviewed by independent international committees. To stay at the forefront of research, we develop uh, state-of-the-art instrument and cutting-edge technologies transferred to society, Training and education are part of our mission. We promote open science, open access publication, open hardware, open software, education available to, to everyone. And the social economical impact of this research uh, organization direct, directly through the science we do and indirectly through knowledge transfers, industrial return, education are very important also. This return is very important also to, um, to get the continuous support of the member states. So what do we learn from this? And how can uh, fundamental scientific research that this organization pursue? Um, what can uh, this research do for society, in particular during the, uh, the COVID area, but also uh, beyond? So fundamental research brings, first of all, knowledge. And knowledge is the fuel, fuel of, of progress. And history shows uh, that a major breakthrough um, and major ideas often actually come from fundamental research. Uh, that research that looks like useless, as Minister Manfredi said, and uh, that uh, um, Habram Flexner, a US educator, called uh, in 1938 the usefulness of useless knowledge. So for instance, today, without the knowledge of quantum mechanics, we will not have the electronic microscope which is used to study uh, the, the, the virus. And so, um, science and knowledge are fundamental to address um, uh, the challenges of, of society. Second, innovation. As I showed, science is a driver of innovation um, and uh, is able to boost technological development in a way uh, that will be unimaginable without the driving force of fundamental research and, uh, and the thirst for, for knowledge. Science also means collaboration across borders and across uh, disciplines. Uh, today's global challenges require 
a global solution. And uh, this means that we have to work together, and, and science is used to it, and science can show the way. And I think Ilaria Capua later on will show some example of this uh, collaboration across borders and across uh, discipline. Training and education. We, we live in a world where uh, the job in STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, grow today three times faster than any other job. And so to prepare the workforce of tomorrow, we need to educate the younger generation to science. But also in general, a, a minimum level of scientific education is fundamental, is important to uh, grow and to have well-rounded citizens in terms of uh, critical thinking, in terms of uh, um, based judgment of, uh, on evidence, uh, in terms of uh, using the scientific methods and understand, understanding the meaning of a measure and its, uh, and its uncertainty. And finally, another important, uh, um, another important concept, uh, scientific knowledge and scientific education for all are indispensable for reducing inequalities. We live in a world where technology um, grows very fast, and this uh, will only increase the gap between the rich and the poor, the developed countries and the developing countries, those who have access and those who don't have access to technologies. And so open science, education available for, for everybody, and these are very, very strong, empowering tools, must really be pursued by everyone, by scientific uh, institutions like CERN and many others, but also by uh, governments. So let me conclude by saying that uh, scientific research is not just knowledge, it's much more than that. It's a system of, of values, and that the, the, COVID, the COVID crisis has shaken the world and has shown that our society is not sustainable. So now we can do two things. We can try to apply a quick fix and try to go, to go back to the so-called old normal, or we can use this crisis as an, an opportunity to change our worlds and to move towards a more sustainable and uh, inclusive uh, planet and a society. And I argue that one of the foundation stones for a better world is a more prominent role for science. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Gianotti. And now let's have a look oversee Ilara, Ilaria Capua, director of the One Health Center of Excellence at the University of Florida. Thanks for joining us today. Thank Should you, be. thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's morning on this side of the Atlantic. Um, I am in the middle of the hurricane season, and so if you agree, I will cut my video before I start, uh, and then I will reappear at the end, just to make sure that you can hear me properly. Yeah, of so, course. Um, but before I disappear, let me thank uh, Ezov for um, this invitation. And let me thank the speakers who have preceded me uh, from uh, Cardinale Parolin to Minister Manfredi to Fabiola Gianotti because they gave me the perfect springboard to present to you some new ideas uh, um, that have spurred from the uh, COVID-19 crisis. And uh, as uh, Fabiola Gianotti mentioned, no crisis should be wasted. And um, although this is a crisis which has hit uh, Italy, Europe, and uh, I would say is hitting the United States and other parts of the world very hard. It can actually be the beginning of um, a more uh, sustainable way of, of organizing our lives, given that as homo sapiens, uh, we have been equipped with, um, let's say, um, gray material inside our uh, heads and we should use it to think. And I think that this is a really uh, great opportunity we have now. So um, if you agree, I, am, I have now disappeared and uh, I hope you can see 
the my presentation in full screen. So yes. I will try and um, uh, merge some of the things that have been said before me um, and uh, try to convince you all, not only the people who are sitting in the room, uh, not only the panelists, uh, but also all the people who are connected online, um, that COVID-19 is screaming at us that we need more interdisciplinarity to accelerate the big changes that we need to put in place to face this moment of crisis and transform the crisis in an opportunity. So um, let me start from many, many, many years ago. Some of you may remember this diagram. This is actually a diagram of, which was put down around the uh, 13th century, but uh, it represents the thinking of uh, the uh, Greek philosophers and how ancient thought actually had, um, let's say, put health in a, in a circle, not in a square, not in a pillar, but in a circle. And um, so this circle has a heart. And the heart is mundus annus homo. And so let me just show you uh, what this means in modern times, okay? So mundus annus and homo. Mundus means the world, means the world in its entirety. It means the environment. It means biodiversity. It means animals. It means plants. It means water. It means air. Annus means time, because of course, a disease, any disease or health can be perceived and managed in ways that are completely different if you still have to discover how a virus works, if you still have to move information with camels, or if you have big data that can help you to, to um, analyze what you're trying to study. And then of course, homo the human being. The human being is a central part to uh, how health is managed because we are the ones in charge. So let me dissect this, um, some of these ideas and let me show you why um, when, when the ancients thought about mundus, the world, uh, we actually have a very clear connection with COVID-19. This virus, the SARS-CoV-2, comes from a bat, which was supposed to remain in the middle of a jungle. And for reasons which are totally unclear, this bat, which carried a virus, arrived in a live animal market. Live animal markets are ugly places, very ugly places, which contain animals that should not be together. Here you have dogs and rabbits. Dogs are predators, rabbits are prey. In this environment, you have fear. You, fear generates high levels of, cortical, of cortisone, and this reduces the immune status of the animals. You have cats and, um, and, and monkeys together. And then you have pangolins. Pangolins are one of the world's most uh, po poached animal. They are uh, on the verge of being extinct because they are captured for their scales. Their scales are part of the traditional Chinese medicine and they are butchered all the time. And uh, the virus of the bat that got into this live bird market uh, recombined uh, most likely with the virus coming from a pangolin and this is this virus that emerged was not only able to infect animals, but was also able to infect humans very successfully. So let's go to Anus and let me give you a little example. This is what Wuhan, the epicenter of the pandemic, looked like a hundred years ago. There were camels. And so I 
don't think anybody can exclude that even in these days, they used to go and catch bats. And even in these days, they used to sell the bats at a market, but certainly they did not have the power of spreading the disease that we have now. On the left, you see a map of the world with the uh, airline connections. And it is clear that in 2020, in uh, a fully globalized environment, the impact of that one single minuscule ball of jelly can be truly transformational. And we also mentioned Homo. It is people who spread the pandemic. Let's not forget that in this case, like in many other cases, it is people uh, through their man-related ac activities that spread diseases. And so apart from being uh, the main actors of disease spread, they are also, ma men are also, human beings are also the ones who have the power to resolve these complex issues, um, as Minister Manfredi uh, mentioned. And so I would like to take you through some thinking on why this is such a complicated issue. Minister Manfredi mentioned um, the uh, addressing complex issues because COVID-19 is a stress test for many, many systems. And the first one, which we must mention and which we must not ignore, is of course a stress test for the economy. So the way the economy is organized, and this is a graph that relates mainly to the, that relates to the United States, um, it, the economy cannot absorb a hit of this power. Um, this graph shows the number of uh, unemployment benefit requests that occurred in the United States over 50 years. Uh, but COVID-19 is also a disease of fragile cities. It is uh, a disease that has devastated some of our uh, beautiful cities, European cities that have a gigantic cultural heritage. Milan has never been so empty and Milan needs to get back to where it was. But it's not only Milan. There are other cities that have shown their fragility, New York, London, Paris, Madrid. So we need to look at COVID-19 as a, a stress test for certain cities. And we need to understand why. Because when I get challenged with questions like, uh, but why is what happened in, in, um, in the north of Italy, particularly in the Lombardy region, not the same to what happened to other cities? I say because it is the disease is, is spread by people and it is spread through cities that are organized systems. And cities also have to absorb the healthcare burden. And so once again, we enter the complexity of addressing these issues um, from a scientific perspective. But it is now also a disease of gatherings and of social life no one wants to change their social behavior. No one wants to remain segregated from the elderly or the fragile. Um, and also uh, people are uh, entitled and rightfully should protest. But these protests actually are creating the beginning of a negative spiral in which the protests create tension and the tension fuels more protests and this brings to more people and more people getting together and not wearing a mask and not distancing uh, in an appropriate way. We also have to question if this is a disease of movement. Uh, we have, my generation of scientists has moved uh, very, very much, has traveled all over the world, has been and has made uh, their, their career through experiences and exchange in other laboratories. And, and now we have to think and we have to reflect on whether massive travel is, makes sense 
uh, from many points of view, including the environmental viewpoint of view, which is extremely important, which uh, Cardinale Parolin mentioned and which I will return to at the end of this talk. In fact, here it is. Uh, COVID-19 is a disease that influences pollution. We have shown that uh, the lockdown applied in many parts of the world has reduced some of the um, emissions and certainly nature is back and nature is, is here just in case uh, anybody hadn't really uh, noticed, but we are living an experiment. And this experiment is that we have had to stop the world basically for six months. And we are also able to document that experiment and see the short term, medium time and long time and long term ramifications of this experiment. And so it would have been impossible to reproduce what we are seeing now in the field in a laboratory. It would have been impossible to see, to, to answer the question, if we switch off a certain part of the man-related activities that produce emissions, will the planet respond? And the answer is yes, because we are seeing this. Another one of the issues that we need to look at um, under different lens is actually the pink lens of why sex is such an important driver in, um, in COVID-19 because all over the world, we see that women are less at risk of developing um, the severe form. Um, I just need to say that, that COVID-19 is a truly epochal event. Uh, we have heard all sorts of uh, uh, positions that have been taken. Uh, I like to cite The Economist because it has some very, very uh, good covers uh, and uh, meaningful covers. And um, I think these two uh, summarize a little bit what we are talking about here. Certainly the pandemic is here uh, and we, are the people and we are the creatures that are in charge of managing it. So we have to keep calm, carry on, and continue to wash our hands, social distance, stay at home if you're sick, avoid handshakes and uh, see a doctor. So let us not forget that we all have a responsibility, but, and, we know that every cloud has a silver lining and I see this pandemic actually um, even more than a cloud with a silver lining. I see this cloud, the, the cloud of the pandemic that has a rainbow within. The rainbow is incorporated in this crisis and the rainbow that I see is that we have had to stop the world for a certain period of time. We have had to stop things that were unstoppable. We have had to uh, change many, many things of our life and we now have to start again. And we can start again uh, advancing health as a system and advancing health uh, under the guidelines of the sustainable development goals. And to advance health as a system, we cannot only concentrate on advancing the health of humans. And this brings me back to my first diagram. Here is our diagram about health, mundus anus homo. We have a pandemic, a pandemic is happening, and we still have great problems of pollution, of infectious diseases, and of water supply. We have issues with global warming, we have issues with many, many, many environmental factors, the reduction of biosecurity, of sorry, of biodiversity. And uh, it is time that we actually use big data and we use big data science and we find convergencies around all these issues that are not gonna go away, they are here. They are here. We know that we have a gigantic climate issue. We know that we have polluted the seas and that the seas are full of plastic. We know that some parts of our earth, of our mother earth, is full of toxic residues. And we have to look to the future 
to try at least and prepare an infrastructure so that the next generation will be able to have all the information it needs to move this change of, uh, from an unsustainable uh, situation that the planet is undergoing to a more sustainable condition. And uh, at the University of Florida, we have launched uh, together with some partner institutions, uh, Fabiola Gianotti mentioned our collaboration earlier. Uh, we have a collaboration with several organizations, uh, including the uh, C-Cities, which is the conference of the big cities of the world. And we are looking at a series of interdisciplinary issues, like how do you govern, and, and this is a totally open uh, effort, uh, how do you govern an open effort of this size? We have studies on gender differences, on mobility and mental health, on climate change and pollution, on many, many, many aspects. And I want to, I don't want to make it longer than what it is, but we, we really see COVID opportunity as a great opportunity for science, uh, for uh, the useful knowledge which has been generated by organisms, organizations like, like CERN, to be used in an interdisciplinary man manner to find and to seek together those global solutions that we need. Um, I would like to also um, come back to the words of Professor Manfredi. Uh, research needs to become a common good. We need to foster interdisciplinarity, collaboration and openness. And of course, the key to the future of open science is citizen science, which was mentioned uh, before. So homo sapiens, I think, are uh, to be seen as the guardians of the planet, the guardians of health as a system. And um, I would really like to invite you to reflect on this uh, rainbow within the cloud, which uh, uh, we should uh, use and uh, learn to exploit, because I think that time is ready for uh, another paradigm shift. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ilaria Capua, and with this beautiful image of a rainbow and so a message of hope. Uh, I would like to thank you again, our speakers today, um, Gaetano Manfredi, Professor Fabiola Gianotti, Ilaria Capua from University of Florida. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. And now I invite another three guests to join me to discuss international policies of scientific research in different parts of the world. First, join me in welcoming Fabrizio Nicoletti, Director General of Innovation and Research, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who is here with us today, if you want to join me on stage. Please take a seat. Thank you very much for being here today. Thanks to you, and good um, afternoon to you all. I'll leave you the floor to you now. It's, uh, f first of all, I would like to underline the full support of the Italian Ministry of Affairs to this initiative and uh, the gratitude of, for me for being here today to this in inauguration. Obviously, when we were asked as a Ministry of Affairs to support the initiative, we accepted immediately as we, with the Friuli Venezia Giulia region and with Trieste, of course, we have a, a great collaboration and because, of course, we want to support the research system of, of, of this region and of the Italian uh, system at all, uh, speaking at large. But, you know, I always like to use 
the, and, and quote what my uh, predecessors uh, just said. Uh, because it was quoted by Fabiola Gianotti that CERN was created after a crisis. And so it came to my mind uh, the facts that uh, uh, a Nobel Prize, a uh, literature Nobel Prize, Winston Churchill said that from this part of the world, on the Adriatic coast, on the eastern part of the coast, that uh, that part of the world well, you know, always created more history, more historical facts that they can uh, digest. And uh, so it came to my mind also the fact that we have a long tradition here in Trieste with historical facts, obviously, which a very strong, uh, a very uh, strong uh, history uh, very important with many, many aspects from many points of view. Uh, therefore, uh, we can say proudly that Trieste now uh, is after so many years has became back a, a vital place, a vital city, a vibrant city which is showing how his, the city itself and the regions have digested all the history which was through this part of the world. And it is creating a huge sort of bridge between the Italian culture, the culture that we are from the other side of the borders, and it, it is definitely a, an, uh, an example uh, for friendship, peace. And this is, in the end, what is all about what was said. Because in, in, if you think deeply, it's science is, is helping human beings, helping lives to live in better conditions. We have just said now that the pandemic, and we all know the damages which created the, the sorrow which brought to, to the whole world, and definitely for us here today is a great occasion where brains from all over the world, they can be together and think from the various points of view how to tackle this point. Ministry of Foreign Affairs, is in this aspect is not only for supporting this initiative, but of course, this is a mainstream in which we are involved and we collaborate with all the institutions, not only the Italian institutions, international institutions, because this is a common path that we are following together. Uh, Ilaria Capo just close her section uh, quoting the um, SDGs, obviously. SDGs for us, for the world world, and obviously for Italian Republic, it's, a, it's a, definitely a, a key point that uh, we want to hit, and uh, for which we, next year, we will uh, host in Italy the Youth COP26, the pre-COP26, and then, uh, as you know, uh, Italy will have the presence of the G20 and many subjects, many aspects of what was said and, and quoted early, uh, early on are exactly in the, in the topics that they will be uh, discussed on, on those occasions. So, Again, this is a sort of fil rouge which can link and it will link all the aspects of different, uh, uh, different visions and different culture and, and different approach that in the end they should all end up with a pro process for a definitely, a, hopefully also, but definitely a, a better world for, and better conditions of living. 
I take this opportunity to, to share the, the, the information that in, in this point, as because we want, definitely we believe that science it's, helps, really helps to develop society. We, as Minister of Foreign Affairs, we are increasing our presence, our scientific presence in our network all around the world. And this is occasion for me to pass this information on this, today on this inauguration, which means that it's a sort of invitation to the scientific institutions, to scientific centers, to professors, to researchers, to, be, to knock to our doors, to use our facilities, which are there to help the international collaboration for science. So this is uh, what is uh, the key message that we wanted as Minister for Affairs to pass to, on this occasion. And I really conclude wishing the best of success to this initiative. And thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much to the organization, because I know that it was very tough and uh, uh, very challenging to, to be able to organize such an important event under these circumstances. So this is one more credit to Trieste Municipality, to the uh, Friuli Venezia Giulia region, and obviously to the organizations itself. First of all, Professor Stefano Fantoni. Grazie mille. Thank you very much, Mr. Nicoletti. And now a couple of speakers who are connected with us remotely. One of the key goals of Ease of 2020 Trieste is actually to make the city a reference point for new scientific and cultural connections between Western and Eastern Europe. Such an opening to the East will be crucial to foster European cohesion, to strengthen the European research area, and to define a common scientific identity across the continent. Today with us from Montenegro, Sania Damianovic, Minister of Science in the government of Montenegro since 2016. Good afternoon, welcome, and I turn it over to you now. Yeah, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, so I'm really sad that I'm not in Trieste at this moment, but I'm really, really happy to have opportunity to talk today at the European Open Science Forum. I'm especially happy that this as of ease in Trieste a city which has such rich historical and culture, cultural relations with its neighboring region of the Western Balkans where I'm coming myself from. My perspective on the topic of science in society, one of the key topics of this year as of will be how I myself see this relationship being constructed in our region. One very significant part of my perspective is due, due to my long career outside the Balkans, especially at CERN in Geneva, where I have spent the largest part of my scientific life. Probably we should all remember that in the past, our region had strong technological development, which enabled a rapid increase in the standard of living, strong industrialization, educational and cult cultural achievements. And there are plenty of great examples for that. However, there were several reasons for the breakdown of societies of our region during the 90s. But perhaps for today's conversation, it is interesting to focus on how the change of the social structures caused a significant scientific slowdown, the effects of which we are still uh, uh, feeling, and like in particular strong brain drain. Today's re-emergence of the concept of science diplomacy is trying to look at the complexity of this relationship and to provide a much better framework for how science and society can work better for each other and especially how science can deliver much more efficiently. 
We all know that research infrastructures have already be, been proven to have a powerful social and economical impact as a multinational venture, helping solving global challenges as powerful neutral tools with the mission of science diplomacy. After two great concrete examples of CERN in Geneva and Cezanne in Jordan, I am proud today to inform you about yet another concrete example of science diplomacy, the large-scale pan-European research infrastructure SEAS project, which I have led from the very start. To recover the great tradition in technology which we had in the past, to slow down brain drain or even to revert it, we need such large-scale infrastructures based on the newest technology. So the SEAS project is targeting one of the largest social challenges, cancer. It aims at boosting new technologies to fight cancer by powerful international cooperation. This new generation of a beyond state-of-the-art medical accelerator dedicated on equal ground to cancer research and cancer treatment will be based in Southeast Europe, but will be benefit for the Euro Europe as a whole. We are presently working with the international team to make this institute a reality, and I hope that at one of the next ESOF, we will be sho showcasing the realization of the SAIST. Trieste, as a city, and the organizing team of this ESOF are making a very important contribution to raising the issue of the Western Balkans, science and innovation, by including several discussions in its program, I would like to sincerely thank you for this, and I hope that is, this ESOF will give another push to cooperation between Western Balkans people and the people from other European countries. Let's work together with our citizens because there is our strength. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for joining us today. And ESOF, we all know, is primarily a European event, but of course, that's not the only focus. It looks beyond European borders, of course, to the rest of the world, as science does. Science as a universal language. Today, our last guest would have been Mr. Emmanuel Ziman, Minister of Higher Education, Science and Technology of South Africa. Unfortunately, due to some last-minute commitments, he can't be with us today. But on his behalf, we have a video contribution by Dr. Phil Njara, Director General of the South African Department of Science and Innovation. Ministers, the ESOF champion, the president of Euroscience, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for this invitation to speak at the opening session of ESOF 2020. I bring you the good wishes of South Africa's Minister of Higher Education, Science and Innovation, Dr. Blayden Zimande, who unfortunately, due to urgent business of government, is unable to join us this afternoon. South Africa has a historic relationship with ESOF, and over the years, the forum has played an important role in strengthening our strategic science and innovation partnership with Europe. It also provided the inspiration for the organization of our own Science Forum South Africa, an event known to many of you. We are therefore delighted to also actively support ESOF 2020, taking place in an important country, Italy, and in a city, Trieste, which hosts several of our strategic partners, including the World Academy of Sciences, the International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, and the International Center for Theoretical Physics. Building effective, mutually beneficial global partnerships is a consistent theme and priority of national strategy and policy uh, documents for science, technology, and innovation in South Africa. Indeed, South Africa has embraced the principle that science knows no borders and actively promotes international cooperation. Given the myriad of societal challenges of our time, including climate change, energy, food security, and health, it is imperative that international science cooperation be enhanced. 
No country alone has the resources, both human capital as well as funding, to address global issues on its own. Cooperation in science, technology and innovation is also key in achieving the United Nations Sustainable uh, Development Goals. Harnessing research and innovation to improve the lives of South Africans remains our priority, addressing the triple challenges of poverty, unemployment and inequality. The timing of ESOF 2020 is opportune to have a discussion on science and the critical role that it plays as we face the global pandemic of COVID-19. South Africa has a strong collaboration in science, technology and innovation with Europe through various partnership programs, which has been further enhanced through cooperation in addressing COVID-19. As seen across the globe, science, technology and innovation has played a key role in responding to the public health challenges posed by COVID-19. Research and innovation are indeed at the heart of efforts to detect, treat and prevent the pandemic. The role that science advice plays to policy makers has also been central in the decision making processes in enhancing the management of COVID-19. Generating and applying new knowledge is crucial to finding solutions and addressing these challenges. I am therefore delighted that Professor Salim Abdul Karim, who chairs South Africa's Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19, will speak during Friday's morning special ESOF session on lessons we have learned from the pandemic to prepare for future uh, global health challenges. Prof Karim will join all friends of South Africa and leading global scientists like Professor Michael Kizakchkin a champion in the fight against HIV AIDS. No country has been spared the devastating negative impact of COVID-19 on their economies. Across the globe, uh, we have seen significant rises in unemployment, the widening of inequality, with the most vulnerable of populations at greater risks than ever. We have at our disposal the immense potential of innovation and technology to not only reinvigorate growth in existing industries, but also to develop new ones, safeguarding existing and creating new economic opportunities. Our world is changing. Not least among these changes are the greater interconnectivity between countries and continents, which means developments such as disease outbreaks in one region rapidly spread to another. Simply put, our problems are also our neighbors' problems. More than ever, we need greater global solidarity. Especially, and this is perhaps the most pressing societal challenge of our time, to confront the rising, unacceptable and very dangerous inequalities which impact on all aspects of our society. Nowhere is this more evident than the huge discrepancies, discrepancies sorry, with regard to access to affordable health care citizens of our planet are faced with, often merely determined by the fortune of, or misfortune of where one is born. It is not only the nature of our challenges which are changing, but also the actors involved in responding to them. The role of non-state actors such as multinational companies have become essential informing the need for new and innovative models for public-private partnerships. State actors are too changing. Emerging economies have stepped up their investment in research and innovation and new South-South alliances offer new options for international cooperation. As we seek to understand and respond to these challenges, it is comforting to know that the role of science, technology and innovation as instruments for sustainable development, including the improving or quality of lives of our citizens, is featuring prominently on our political agenda. Despite the constraints of economic crisis, many countries have sustained and even increased their national research and innovation investments, which are bearing results as we collectively 
address global challenges. Meetings such as ESOF provide an important platform to exchange ideas, best practice, and network with international partners on key areas of scientific enterprise, as well as enhance international cooperation and science diplomacy. It is also within this context that South Africa will be hosting the World Science Forum in 2021 on the theme of science for social justice. I look forward to welcoming all of our SF partners in Cape Town in December 2021 for the World Science Forum as our world unites for and through science. As we move forward, there is an increased need to embrace the strategic and in in international role that science and technology and innovation will continue to play towards socio-economic recovery. Within this framework, we should collectively optimize opportunities presented through the green economy, the fourth industrial revolution, and the associated benefits of the digital economy. Our world is perhaps even more fragile than before, but we have a real opportunity for effective science and research to make a real difference. We should seize it. I am confident as of 2020 will play its part to make this difference. I thank you and wish you a, an enjoyable and inspiring as of 2020. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me thank you, um, thanks all the speakers again for their contribution. Thank you, Dr. Nicoletti. Thank you to the uh, Minister of Science of Montenegro and also to Dr. Phil uh, Moara from South Africa. And now it's time for a special gift, a special gift for Trieste European City of Science 2020. Poste Italiana is launching today a special stamp celebrating Ease of 2020. And this is the first time in Ease of history that a stamp is dedicated specifically to the event. This commemorative stamp was commissioned by Fondazione Internazionale Trieste and the Municipality of Trieste. It was printed by Istituto Poligrafico e Zecca dello Stato and designed by Synthesis Hub. I would like to invite now Giulio Iandiorio from Poste Italiana and the Mayor of Trieste, Roberto Di Piazza, to join me on stage to present the stamp to the public. Yeah, we can just... Yeah, probably better. <laughs> Grazie, eh, buon pomeriggio a tutti. Thank you and good afternoon. It is really an honor for me to represent the Italian Postal Service in this uh, important international event. Of course, I wish to convey to you the greetings of uh, our manager and the president and uh, of the board of directors of the Italian Postal Service. And I wish to thank the municipality of Trieste asking us uh, to issue such a commem commemorative stamp. And I thank the Ministry for the Economy that has allowed us to have such uh, an issue. It is important to have uh, a stamp celebrating Ease of 2020. Why? Because a stamp is something that historically is passed on to future generation, and it passes on events, uh, historical uh, characters. Even if it is so small, it passes on culture over time. I'm particularly happy that on such an occasion, a stamp has been issued Maybe we, we can see a picture of the stamp. And this is a stamp, and you see the uh, light posts of Trieste. These are the lamp posts of Trieste uh, with the um, light uh, beams 
and it is a symbol of the combination of the city, a city of culture, a multi-ethnic culture, as the mayor was reminding us before, and these light beams, light beams that can, that can pass on culture to future generations. It is a limited issue of this commemorative stamp. And you see the B1 area, which means that the stamp will be available not just in Italy, but also in Europe and in the Mediterranean area. And this is very important, I think. And for this, I thank the ministry once again. Stamps uh, bring us memory. They do pass on culture to future generations. They stay in time. And I hope, I hope that this event will further contribute to disseminate culture and knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ian Diorio. Um, I wish to thank the Italian Postal Service. This is a very important uh, for my city, the fact that attention has been drawn on to Trieste with the issue of this stamp. Uh, it's a, quite a nice memory of this event, Stefano. We've been so passionate about this event. Uh, we've been fighting against everything and everyone, but I think we can be very happy for what we have achieved. Thank you. I wish to thank the Italian Postal Service once again. And with the presentation of this special gift, we have now come to the end of this event. I hope you've got a taste of this new Ease of 2020 Trieste edition and enjoyed the inspiring insights and talks from our speakers. Before leaving you, I would like to thank once more all our guests and speakers, all the national, international, and local authorities, and all of you who have joined us today here and all over the world. I hope you will enjoy the rich program of Ease of 2020 Trieste, and I wish you to spend a great time here in Trieste. Enjoy and keep safe. Thank you very much. You look for the earth. That's where we live. Now, that our numbers are enormous, and our technology formidable, even awesome. It seems to me there is a profound obligation to play a role in determining and safeguarding the human future. Civil liberties, freedom of speech, these are essential tools for understanding the new world we are entering. Your potential influence is great. There are many ways to be involved in these issues.